Good FD Mida. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for Volvo Construction for their kind invite for me to address you today. Um, I was especially pleased to receive the invite um, because previously I had worked for WWF. I was part of their senior management team many years ago. In fact, uh, working with academia, uh, we were looking at the uh, Im impacts, climate change impacts on a number of species back in 1997, the year of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, and indeed, my connection uh, with Sweden is also that uh, I had the great pleasure of working with colleagues of WSP, the Design and Engineering Environmental Consultancy, based here in Gutenberg and Stockholm and other places, uh, leading on uh, uh, innovations around future cities and sustainable cities. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be back in Sweden, so, so thank you. Let me just see who's still awake. Where are you? Where are you? Okay, so hands up if you know who Balfour BTR. Okay, excellent. So there's a bit of awareness. So Balfour BT is a, a global infrastructure company. Uh, we work across 11 countries, uh, the North America, uh, UK and Europe. We're over in Asia and China and the Middle East. Uh, and we provide services, goods and services to help society function. Railways, transportation, thinking about new energy, renewable energy, building homes, hospitals, schools, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, we also uh, have flagship buildings. Yeah? One of the 10 most sustainable buildings in America uh, was under our, our construction. And we also help cities regenerate. Uh, so here's an example in Southampton of how we help with the local infrastructure in the public realm. Uh, and that helps create economic uh, prosperity, creating jobs, bringing people back into communities using city centre areas. In terms of our leadership uh, in carbon, um, between the period 2010 and 2014, just in the UK, we saw a 40% reduction in our scope one and two emissions. Um, so in many ways, going back to the earlier presentation around how do we decouple uh, emissions from economic growth, uh, we're on that journey. Um, we're also measured by the Carbon Disclosure Project um, as one of a, a number of global companies in the sector we're actually leading. So, um, you know, we are trying to not only just influence our customers, um, we're also trying to uh, actually address the issues of, of uh, carbon emissions internally. Now then, what was my role today? Well, I was actually asked to try and predict what some of the key main themes might be that were coming through from today's conference. And then maybe to give us a little bit of hope that actually there is some activity out there, rather than just talk, talking, that actually is leading to the, the implementation of solutions that are going to try and correct the problem that we've got. So that was my challenge. And uh, can I just say, I'm not clairvoyant. I don't have a crystal ball. I didn't know what we were going to be discussing today. And guess what? I haven't got it right. Isn't that interesting? Because how many times have we heard the word adaptation? Isn't that a challenge for us? Didn't we hear in the morning that our climate's going to be growing? Yeah, our climate's going to be increasing temperature by at least 1.5 degrees. We're going to have to start to adapt to climate change, whether we like it or not. So of course we have to mitigate but we have to adapt. Anyhow, more about that later. So, um, just thinking about a, a key presentation, I want to tell you my summary now, just in case I never get to the end of my presentation. So what are my conclusions? My conclusions are that we need to have the right investors. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about that. Investor confidence, certainty, how do we price the risk, yeah? We need that. We need new business models. And we've talked about that a little bit today, particularly around the circular economy. And I'll give you some examples of that. We haven't talked about capacity building too much. We talked a little bit about SMEs and how to engage with them. But what is the talent that we need to attract into our industry? What's the skills that we're going to need to solve these future problems? I don't think we've addressed that today. But we have certainly talked a lot about collaborative working and indeed integrating thinking. And I, I made the point in my, one of my questions, or at least an observation, about th how design is key to all of this. And I will dwell upon that later in, in my project examples. And then I think just making sure that as an industry, and we're talking about the construction sector here, that we start to measure the things that really matter. If we go back to the morning, we're talking about changing outcomes. And I'll, I'll describe to you what I mean by that. Why do we need to measure 
outcomes. Typically, in our sector, we do this. We look at our financial performance, and we have some very basic impact measures. And in construction, what do we do? We put people together with resources, so time, materials, yeah? We use a design, a detailed design, and we work towards that. And as a construction sector, we're judged on what? That we deliver on time, on program, wouldn't that be nice, yeah? And also on quality. And within that quality, we can bring health and safety in, we can bring issues around sustainability as well. So, we have these inputs, and what actually is the output? And we just started to talk a little bit about that today, when I think our colleagues from Skanska were describing schools. So, Skanska, Balfour BT, other contractors can design and build a school. Yeah? But the outcome is not the school. The outcome is what was the purpose of that school, and has it been designed and constructed to deliver the maximum benefit? So here we get into daylight, natural ventilation, creating an environment for children or university uh, students to gain the maximum opportunity to do well in their learning. So the outcome that we are all providing is actually an improvement in the education attainment of our society. We need to be thinking more and more about the outcomes. Yeah? So instead of just doing less bad around reducing emissions, we should be thinking about how we're actually creating an outcome that is taking or changing that. How are we replenishing? How are we putting something back? Doing less good, as we know with the global population, and increased com uh, consumption is okay, but it isn't going to solve the problem. Now then, to get to our outcome, we need really to understand what the benefit is and what the social value is. And that means that we have to consult. We have to really understand what the end user needs, what the community needs, how we can design that, how we can work with our, the supply chain, with our customer, to maximize the opportunity that we can deliver the best possible outcome, given all the constraints that we have. So that's the kind of issue that's puzzling me working for Balfour Beatty you know, across the world. How can we demonstrate the outcomes, the things that really matter? And I'll give you an example. Uh, we've been going through all our portfolio, but this is just one example um, of a construction project. And I'm not going to dwell on the environment side, um, but you can. You can also start to value the environmental benefits and disbenefits. I'm just going to look at some of the social aspects. Okay? So very briefly, uh, this is a, an, an overhead line up in uh, Scotland. Um, we actually work here for our customer, uh, which is Scottish Southern um, Electric. Uh, they are one of the largest uh, utility companies uh, in, 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 the, in the UK. Uh, and they provide a lot of renewable energy. They also get their energy from coal and gas. Um, but they power it in. And because of these new provisions around renewable, they need a whole new set of pylons. Yeah? So we're the contractor that started in 2011 um, making these uh, connections. Uh, and in fact, actually, Balfour Beatty um, have made that connection for about 75% of all the renewable energy we get offshore into the UK. So you get the scene, okay? So we're working in a remote area, ecological impacts, um, and that's what we've been asked to do. So we put our people together, resources, supply chain, and our output is this. This is, if we deliver this, this is our output. Yes, so we constructed 250 kilometers of access tracks. Yes, uh, we erected 539 towers. Brilliant, yes. Uh, oh, we demolished 800 existing towers. That's what our contract says, tick in the box, we've done it. Now then, the question then is, how do we do it? What were the benefits of using us to do that? And so we've looked at it. And this is a very quick infographic that looks at the social benefit of us working with our supply chain. So on a project, and it's still continuing, over three years, we actually generated uh, an additional 420 million of gross value add into the economy. Um, we've supported 840 uh, full, local full-time jobs. Yeah? What's interesting is we're now looking at understanding the impact that we can have in training people up in apprenticeships. In the UK, we have level two and level three apprenticeships. So you take away all the cost of, of training that person up, 
and add the benefit they get in terms of the uplift of their salary, their career progression, how they spend their money in the economy. And we actually find that an apprenticeship for our investment gives back £122,000 back into the UK economy. I would question that these actually are the things that really matter. They certainly would matter to a mayor if you were to say, OK, we're going to do some construction in a city. Yes, we know we're going to have a refurbished road or a new school or hospital, but what else does it mean? So starting to measure the things that really matter. OK, second comment I was going to make uh, was around new business models. We talked about uh, the circular economy. So here I'm going to give you an example of us trying to do that in the UK. So this is looking at environmental legacy uh, and again uh, the circular economy. So how many of you have been to London? Good. How many of you have been to Piccadilly? Do you know where Piccadilly is? Piccadilly Circus, yes, exactly. So this is St. James's Market. Uh, it's very close to Piccadilly. It's an area which we call the Hay Market. It's owned by the Crown Estate. So there's a company that owns or manages property on behalf of the Queen. She owns a lot of land. Uh, she also owns sea rights, the coastal paths, etc. Um, and a few good whiskey distilleries, I might add. Um, anyhow, it's, uh, it's a new piece, a new, scam, new landscape of London. It's about 226,000 square feet of new commercial and retail space uh, and a new 10,000 square uh, foot piazza. There's two buildings, one of which we've retained the facade because it's a grade one listed building, and the other which we've demolished. We put forward the design and build. So we're designing it and building it. So we have the opportunity to influence the design and how we construct it and the types of materials we use. So St. James's Market, SGM, closing the loop. What are the opportunities? And I don't have much time to dwell on this diagram, but we've looked at retaining the facade. Okay? So you know, it's always a good thing to start off with thinking, well, actually, the biggest benefit we can have is probably not doing the job or doing the construction in the first place and creating any kind of impact. So we should be challenging ourselves as to the vi viability and the feasibility of it. So we've retained the facade. Um, we're in the recycling mode. So we've given back carpet tiles, slates, switchboards, etc., to local community projects. Uh, salvaging stuff on site. We've, we've, we've uh, been crushing a lot of the demolition work so we can use it in engineering fills. Uh, off site, uh, recycling of uh, construction and demolition waste, going to a materials research uh, facility. Um, and then this is quite interesting, this is why I want to dwell on. We've been looking, working with our supply chain at extensive new materials. We have a high recycled content, uh, looking at uh, plasterboard carpets and various types of packages. Um, and then actually considering where we can get virgin material from the Crown Estate, so starting off at the beginning, yeah, the cradle to cradle, so in the beginning, then using it on the building, then implementing it into BIM, so that we have a full understanding of the products and design of the building. So when it's handed over through the generations, people can deconstruct, reuse, recycle, repair of these materials. So here's a couple of examples. Oh, I beg your pardon. There's a site waste segregation where we've, we've also um, given back some other things uh, to a local uh, community. So here we go, stone. Stone's quarried. The Crown Estate owns some quarries. We've taken it. We've taken it um, and worked um, for in a, a manufacturing uh, place in North Lincolnshire. That's probably about 150 miles away from London, um, and that becomes the cladding for Regent Street. Uh, likewise, we've used um, stone again in temporary facilities. Uh, we've, we've, we've gone to outer London to fabricate them into solid stone panels that will uh, be used on the panels for Haymarket. What about timber? Okay, the Crown Estate owns Windsor Park and the Great Forest. That's about 20 miles outside of central London. So we've actually taken London Plain. We've felled 20 trees. We've taken them to a reprocessing centre up in Grantham. Again, that's in Lincolnshire. Um, and now we're going to be using them for the fit out. So they'll be there in the, in the reception. What happens to it next and how it closes the loop is unknown. You know, these um, buildings. You know, will last for a long time. The work that we've done should be another 50, 60 years. The uh, reception may well be changed in terms of its fit out. Um, but then, as I said, all the information is available to the user, um, how it was constructed, to deconstruct, and then we consider what, what happens uh, to it. So you know, these are just a, one example of ways we're looking with our customers to be thinking about um, the circular economy and construction. So my final comment, uh, which I was thinking would, would have been an important one, 
uh, for us all to have been discussing earlier on is the issue of adaptation. Now, earlier on we talked about how construction companies don't work together. Well, yes and no. This is the M25. It's the orbital motorway around London, and we're working with Scansa together. We're collaborating. Uh, let me explain the project to you. It's a bit complicated, but basically the Secretary of State works with the Highways Agency, but equivalent to the Swedish Transport Authority, and we form a, a special joint venture, Connect Plus, and basically we, we take on board the ownership of the M25, and we do a number of things which I'll, I'll describe. And we need a, an injection of cash, and that comes from the shareholders. Here's your proud Swedish company, Skanska, together with Balfour Beatty, a design engineering company, Atkins, and Aegis. And then we split it up. But the important thing here is that we have our supply chain approved and wanting to work with us and to collaborate. So um, that's the network. I won't dwell too much on it, because I actually want to get... Uh, oh, pardon. But what does that involve, you know, maintaining and looking after a motorway? Uh, there's loads of assets, and we've got a lot to look after. So our work covers not just a carriageway, but tunnels, lighting, drainage, all those things. Um, by the way, the plane isn't ours. Uh, so here again are, are, are some key facts. Um, we, do, we have a lot of KPIs around performance. Uh, we do get a, a payment. You know, if we don't do very well, we actually have to give money back. That's not a good place to be. So we've really got to be thinking about how we manage this. And then a key point about this is we've got a 30-year asset management strategy. So it's just like you taking on board ownership of a home and saying to the owner, we're going to give it back to you in 30 years' time in the same kind of state as, you found, as we took it on. So in 30 years, we have to think about how the world's going to change, what are the impacts, and that takes us to climate change. And why is climate change important? Well, you know, we've had fallen trees on the carriageways, and high winds overturning, HGV lorries, we've had closures, we've had flooding, you name it. All those things then potentially have an impact on our ability to provide the service and have a negative impact on our balance sheet because we can get penalties, even though you could say it's, it's an act of God. More importantly, it disrupts the UK economy and local residents, and that also has an economic cost. So, um, again, I don't really have time to, to describe this slide. The good thing is it's going to be available to you on the website, and that's why I've included it here. Um, but the important thing is we go through an asset management cycle you know, of understanding the impacts, collecting analysis, and understanding what mitigation to do, but also building in adaptation. What should we be thinking about doing? And let's just take one example here. Uh, let's take flooding, OK? So what's the impact of flooding? We close our carriageway, tunnels are closed, diversion routes are required, there's potential pollution events. That's not good. So we analyze how frequent it's going to be. What's the uh, potential for it to happen? What are the root causes? What did we do previously? What can we do to mitigate it? And what can we do to adapt? So that if we know it's going to happen again, how can we reduce the impact on us? How can we make our road system more climate resilient? Yeah? So we go through all of these issues and start to put up a plan. Yeah? And then we can invest, bring in our supply chain, and so on. So we get to that situation where, again, let's just take, um, let's take the example of flooding, because, um, my big pun, let me just move on. So we start to um, develop a risk register identifying those risks. And that goes on our, in our company, we get to discuss it at the highest level. Yeah? And then we start to think about what's the business case, what are the benefits around adaptation, whether it's performance, finance, environment. So adaptation is really important for us to consider right up front. You know, we heard earlier on, we are living in a world where the climate is changing, with a growing population. We need to consider how to, to mitigate it against it. And actually, just thinking about how we bring our supply chain in. Once we've understood, for example, around asset management, and whether we have to look at flooding, or whether it's heat management, we can actually think about what's the innovation that's needed in design and the new products. So we can then have that discussion with the supply chain. We can stimulate them. We can work together, collaborative working, and start to design that. So adaptation, I think, is important for us to consider. So finally, in wrapping up, uh, what are the challenges that I think we've got in our sector still? Uh, I think we do need to move the conversation to outcomes, because that's the thing that really matters, whether it's about health and well-being, whether it's about those planetary boundaries we talked about. 
Uh, we do need to be far more braver in our approach around materials um, efficiency. We need to do this and we need to demonstrate it. Uh, and in terms of social legacy, uh, sometimes it is difficult talking to stakeholders, but we do need to be inclusive. We do need to make certain that we've got that opportunity to create the biggest or maximize that social outcome. And finally, in terms of standardizing measurements and reporting, I think we've discussed that quite a bit, um, but that's really important, that harmonization. How do we know what we do works? How do we know what good looks like? Absolutely important. And I'm sure you've all seen this slide, yeah? That's the nub of the crux or the issue, yeah? It's about early involvement, getting everybody together to be thinking about what we can do at this stage. And quite often, construction comes in at this stage. When we've got the detailed design, go and build it. And the practicalities of doing that means that we lock in unintended, unintended consequences, and that's not a good place to be. So in summary, yeah, we need to encourage to get the right investors. We need to demonstrate the business case for that to happen. Earlier collaborative working, we do need what I would call engineers, and I'm not an engineer, I'm an environmental scientist by background, but we do need the integrators to understand how the whole system works. That creates the best opportunities for all of us. And then if we start to you know, measure the things that really matter, demonstrate the value of construction in solving some of these problems, I think we've got a great future for ourselves. And let's have an evidence-based approach around those benefits and the value. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul.